on World News Tonight. Daring allegations. India Canada row over slain Sikh leader deepens as protests erupt across the two countries. Petrol pain. Australia issues grim warnings as petrol prices continue to rise across the country. World on watch. Countries call for calm as rising tensions threaten the peace in Nagorno Karabakh region. Panda Awards. Golden Panda Award participants meet the real giant pandas in the Chengdu Research Base. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We have an array of stories lined up for you tonight. We start this Wednesday night with updates on the India-Canada tensions. As Canada is trying not to provoke India by suggesting it was linked to the murder of a Sikh separatist leader, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said they want New Delhi to address the issue properly. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says Canada is not trying to provoke India by alleging it's linked to the murder of a Sikh separatist leader. What's your reaction to that? But says he wants answers. India, the government of India, needs to take this matter with the utmost seriousness. We are doing that. We are not uh, looking to um, provoke or escalate. We are simply laying out the facts as uh, we understand them. The Sikh leader in question is Hardeep Singh Nijar. His image still hangs outside the Vancouver area Sikh temple where he was shot dead in June. He supported the creation of an independent Sikh homeland in northern India called Khalistan. New Delhi has long been unhappy over Sikh separatist activity in Canada, which has the largest population of Sikhs outside Punjab. India branded Niger a terrorist in 2020. It says Trudeau's allegations are absurd. You got called them. The dispute has dealt a fresh blow to the poor diplomatic ties between the two countries. Each has expelled a diplomat over the affair. In Canada, emotions ranged from relief from Niger's son. It was just a matter of time for when the truth would come out. So when we heard that news today, it was a sense of relief that, you know, it's finally coming to the public eyes that, you know, the Indian government is involved. To outrage from Canada's World Sick Organization. Um, to see a Canadian attacked on Canadian soil by a foreign country, uh, I, I think we can't understate how shocking uh, that news is. But in India, protesters denounced Trudeau's explosive assertions. A source who spoke said concern over the killing is directly linked to Canada's pressing pause on a trade deal with India worth billions. Officials have not shed light on why they think India is connected to the killing. But a separate source says Ottawa worked very closely with the U.S. on it. The world is reacting to the Azerbaijan-Armenia tensions over the norgono karabakh attack. Azerbaijan says it wants to disarm Armenian forces, but global powers decree Baku, accusing it of imperiling security. Azerbaijan called the attack an anti-terrorist operation, but many civilians are among the wounded. Hospitals in Stepanakert are treating seriously injured and critically injured children. We were in a park lying under a tree where the children were playing. A bomb fell on a car next to the tree and all the children were injured. We were near the hill when explosions started. We managed to survive. My sister and I survived. But my friend Rozik's cheek got wounded and Miko's neck was injured. As soon as the artillery fire started on Tuesday afternoon, civilians scrambled to find shelter. One eyewitness sent this voice message from inside a bunker. We're all here scared and uh, so... What, what can I tell you? We're circled, uncircled with Azeris, and we're just trapped. And uh, kids are crying, and you can't imagine, yeah, the bunker situation. What can I tell? There is no way out of the panic. 
For this witness, Tuesday's attack was a flashback to 2020 when the bombardment of Stepanakert kicked off the Nagorno-Karabakh war. But three years ago, there was a road out. Now the Lakhan corridor that links Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia is blockaded by Azerbaijan. There aren't enough bunkers to shelter all the residents of Stepanakert. People living in the city are terrified about what could come next. From floods to political turmoil, the aftermath of Libya's worst ever natural disaster has evolved into a political storm after demonstrators furious at the failure to protect their city from a flood towards the home of the mayor of Derna. Libyans are grappling with a stark new reality in the eastern city of Derna. A catastrophic flood last week killed thousands of people and swept many out to sea. Thousands more are still missing. Local resident Mustafa Kamel. Almost a quarter of the city is gone. Between those dead, those missing, as well as others who lost their homes. Certainly the situation will change completely. The flood took place in the heart of the city and not on the outskirts. But now the disbelief is turning to fury. Fury at what residents say was the authorities' failure to protect the city from floods and prevent the disaster. On Monday, demonstrators staged a rally and torched the home of the ousted mayor, who's been suspended. The following morning, journalists said they were ordered out of Derna. Several Arab broadcasters reported that their crews had been told to leave the city. Communications links to the city, which had functioned despite the flood, were shut down. Officials in the administration that runs the East denied they were forcing reporters out. The Eastern administration's interior minister told that journalists and aid workers were operating normally. Monday's mass demonstration was the first reported in the city since it was hit by the worst natural disaster in Libya's history a week earlier. The waters were unleashed when dams burst above Derna in a storm. Angry residents say the disaster could have been prevented. Protester Mohammed bin Hamad says he hopes no Libyan companies are ever involved in rebuilding because there's so much corruption. And demonstrators denounce the eastern-based parliament speaker, who's called the flood a natural catastrophe that could not be avoided. Officials acknowledge that a contract to repair the dams after 2007 was never completed, blaming insecurity in the area. There's a warning tonight from Australia. Sydney's soaring petrol prices could become the new normal as regular unlead hits a new record high average of $2.22 a litre. It's the regular exodus out of Sydney, a family holiday getaway in the car, but filling up has rarely been this expensive. We were at the top of the cycle at the end of last week and over the weekend and we're now starting to fall. While in the past the difference between the cheapest petrol and dearest across Sydney was as much as 50 cents a litre, finding a bargain is harder than ever. The cheapest is $1.96 but the most expensive is $2.30 so there's not a huge spread. Uh, between the cheapest and the most expensive. Along with global factors, our currency, the reason prices are higher than usual. Aussie dollar has been very weak over the past two months. At the same time, you've had crude oil prices and, uh, and gasoline prices that have surged on the back of very tight marketplaces and the like. And unless those factors change... In the near term, I think it's almost guaranteed that we'll see the bottom of the price cycle at least at $2, if not a little bit higher than that. So what to do if you're heading off on a road trip? If you have to top up, top up in Sydney, Fill up when you're outside of Sydney. Don't guess. Get on the NRMA app. Get on the government's fuel check website. There are cheaper service stations outside of Sydney. If you're driving towards Canberra, you can find it at $1.98 at Barrel. If you're heading west, it's also $1.98 in Lithgow. And if you're taking the M1 North just off the motorway at North Wyong, you can pay as little as $1.95. But even if you're staying in town... We're falling less than one cent a day, so it's not at all fast. Uh, but certainly we will get a little bit of relief... Uh, in the coming days and weeks as we head into the school holiday period uh, and into the long weekend in October. Tonight's road to the White House now. Some Joe Biden allies fear that Donald Trump is outmaneuvering them on the auto worker strike with his decision to head to Detroit for a speech, while other Democrats predicted it would flop. 
Democrats close to the White House said they saw Trump's Detroit trip as a plainly cynical ploy to gain political advantage from the current United Auto Workers strike at three plants. But they also worry it is a sign that the ex-president had a more sophisticated campaign than in previous cycles, and that Biden's operation needs to step it up. Inside the White House and Biden campaign, operatives scoffed at such an assessment, but their public utterances, including aggressive criticism of Trump's record on labor policy, betrayed concern that the former president could make further inroads among union voters. And their private deliberations suggested that they were still grappling with how the White House should approach the strike. The back and forth within the White House over how to handle the strike illustrates the jam that Biden finds himself in as talks drag on between the so-called Big Three car companies and a powerful union that is withholding its endorsement from Biden over his handling of electric vehicle subsidies. Though the strike is limited to three plants for now, it could deal a serious blow to the country if a deal isn't reached soon and more workers walk out. The White House has been trying to avoid a prolonged strike while expressing support for the demands of the workers. But there has been brewing dissatisfaction among Democrats and union officials over their approach, mainly a belief that the president, a self-possessed union diehard, underestimated the degree of the UAW's discontent. Welcome back. Over in Russia, the President Vladimir Putin will meet with China's Xi Jinping for talks in Beijing in October. This will be Putin's first known trip abroad since the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant against him back in March of this year. Following recent talks between North Korea's Kim Jong-un and Russia's Vladimir Putin, the Russian president is now set to meet with his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping at the third Belt and Road Forum in Beijing in October, as confirmed by the Secretary of Russia's Security Council Nikolai Petrushev on Tuesday. The two leaders are set to hold substantive talks for closer policy coordination to reshape a global governance system they say is unfairly dominated by the West. In the context of the campaign launched by the collective West to double contain Russia and China, the further deepening of Russian-Chinese coordination and interaction in the international arena is of particular importance. Even with the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, China has refrained from condemning Russia or calling the Kremlin's moves against its neighbor an invasion. China and Russia are currently working together on the formation of what Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi referred to as a multipolar world. Wang is currently in Moscow for security and foreign policy talks with Russian officials. And during a strategic security consultation, he said that both countries are committed to their own independent foreign policies. Both China and Russia are committed to their own independent foreign policies. Our bilateral cooperation is not directed against anyone and is not subject to outside interference. The more violent the unilateral actions of hegemony become, it is even more important for us to keep up with the times, show a sense of duty as great powers, and further fulfill our international obligations. China and Russia have grown closer as relations with the West have deteriorated for both countries. And the October meeting between Putin and Xi will have greater significance, considering it comes ahead of the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Leaders Meeting set for November in San Francisco. Meanwhile, at the UN General Assembly, U.S. President Joe Biden condemned North Korea's missile provocations for violating UN Security Council resolutions while calling for unity on the war in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Zelensky condemned Russia for weaponizing food and energy. U.S. President Joe Biden has condemned North Korea's missile provocations during his speech at the United Nations General Assembly. Addressing world leaders in New York on Tuesday local time, Biden called out North Korea for violating UNSC resolutions, but still left some room for diplomacy. We condemn the DPRK's continued violation of UN Security Council resolutions, but we are committed to diplomacy to bring about the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The president also said the world must remain united in defending Ukraine against Russia's aggression. No nation wants this war to end more than Ukraine. And we strongly support Ukraine in its efforts to bring about a diplomatic resolution that delivers just and lasting peace. 
Speaking at the UN General Assembly for the very first time since the war began, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky accused Russia of weaponizing everything from food and energy to abducted children in its fight against Ukraine. Zelensky also drew attention to tens of thousands of children reportedly kidnapped by Russia. But time, time goes by. What will happen with them? What will happen to them? Those children in Russia are taught to hate Ukraine, and all ties with their families are broken. And this is clearly a genocide. According to an expert, Zelensky's speech was intended to highlight that this matter should be of major concern to UN member states. Zelensky's point there is that civilians, that everyday people in Ukraine, people just going about their lives, are the ones who have been bearing the heaviest brunt of this war. And Zelensky pointed out that more than 140 states and international organizations have supported Ukraine fully or in part. He also stressed that the war is not only about Ukraine, as the world needs solutions and measures that will stop all forms of weaponization used by Russia against Ukraine and potentially by other aggressors. China's loans to Africa fell to its lowest level in nearly two decades. The drop in lending comes as several African nations struggle with the debt crisis and China faces economic headwinds at home. Chinese sovereign lending to Africa fell to the lowest level in nearly two decades, according to data from Boston University's Global China Initiative. The figures underscore Beijing's shift away from a decades-long big-ticket infrastructure spree on the continent. The drop in lending comes as several African nations struggle with debt crises. China's own economy is also facing headwinds. Africa has been a focus of President Xi Jinping's ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. It was launched in 2013 to recreate the ancient Silk Road and extend China's geopolitical and economic influence through a global infrastructure development push. Boston University's Chinese Loans to Africa database estimates Chinese lenders provided $170 billion to Africa from 2000 to 2022. But lending has declined sharp since a 2016 peak. Nine loans totaling $994 million were agreed last year, marking the lowest level of Chinese lending since 2004. African governments largely welcome Chinese lending and infrastructure projects, but Western critics have accused Beijing of saddling poor nations with unsustainable debt. Zambia, a major Chinese borrower, became the first African country to default during the global health crisis in late 2020. Other governments, including Ghana, Kenya and Ethiopia, are also struggling. China, meanwhile, is facing its own problems at home. Policymakers are struggling to revive growth amid persistent weakness in the crucial property industry, a faltering currency and flagging global demand for its manufactured goods. However, the decline in loans does not necessarily mean an end of Chinese engagement in Africa. The Boston University analysis found trends including fewer loans over $500 million and more focus on social and environmental impacts that appear to reflect China's stated push towards a more high-quality, greener Belt and Road initiative. An update on the Spain's kiss scandal now. Spain's World Cup winning squad agreed to end their boycott of the national team after the country's football federation said it would make immediate and profound changes to its structure. The World Cup winning Spain women's national team decided to call off their boycott. This decision came after a Royal Spanish Football Federation pledged to implement significant and immediate alterations to its organizational structure. The agreement was reached following an intense seven-hour discussion that took place at a hotel in Oliva, located an hour away from Valencia, Spain. 
The meeting involved various stakeholders including the players, officials from RFEF, representatives from Spain's National Sports Council and members of the Women's Players Union FootPro. As part of the resolution, a joint commission comprising representatives from RFEF, CSD and the players will be established to monitor the implementation of the agreed-upon changes. Victor Francos, the president of CSD, shared with the media that the players had voiced their concerns about the need for deep-rooted changes within RFEF. In response, the federation has committed to initiating these changes without delay. At the commencement of this month, players initiated a strike disrupting the first two matches of the season. Their grievances revolved around the lack of successful negotiations with the league concerning improved conditions and higher remuneration. Welcome back. For news, let's take it on the world in a minute. A violent tornado wreaked havoc in China's eastern province of Jiangsu, killing one person. And power lines were seen collapsed onto a building as personnel used a crane to conduct rescue work. The attorney for US President Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden, stated that Hunter Biden will plead not guilty to federal gun charges. The 53-year-old was criminally charged for allegedly making false statements when he purchased a gun and possessed a firearm while using illegal drugs at the time. Japan's Okinawa governor, Denny Tamaki, told a United Nations session in Geneva that the concentration of US military bases in the southern prefecture threatens peace. An unusually dense plankton bloom off the eastern coast of Thailand is creating an aquatic dead zone, threatening the livelihood of local fishermen who farm mussels in the waters. The current UN agency and President Alberto Fernandez, the former clandestine detention centre ESMA used during Argentina's last military dictatorship, was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. If you miss any of today's programmes, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash adaderna English. We're leaving you tonight in Chengdu, China as international filmmakers who are participating in the first Golden Panda Awards embrace the unique charm of the beloved panda bears. Thank you for watching. Good night.